We begin with the biggest story in the world of crypto, a multi-billion dollar fraud. And the man behind it has got 25 years in jail, Sam Bankman-Fried. How does his sentencing impact the crypto space? Why is it still so challenging? Why are Indians hooked onto it despite high taxes? India is the world's second largest crypto market and it's booming. Regulators are concerned. We'll bring you the full story. In the Gaza war, global sentiment has shifted firmly against Israel. Even India has spoken against it, but Prime Minister Netanyahu looks set to continue attacking. In India, the electoral race is heating up. Opposition Congress party accuses the government of tax terrorism. We'll explain. In Afghanistan, they'll now flog and stone women to death for adultery. So much for Taliban 2.0. In South Africa, former President Jacob Zuma won't be able to contest the election. We'll tell you why. In Nigeria, a woman faces seven years in jail for posting a negative review of tomato sauce. The case has triggered protests. We are not making it up. The presidents of Argentina, Colombia and Mexico are at loggerheads. We'll tell you why. As the US grapples with the TikTok challenge, their youth are getting hooked on to another Chinese app. Plus highlights from the Bill Gates's, from Bill Gates' interview of Prime Minister Modi and the Macron-Lula bromance that has set the internet on fire. All this and more coming up. The headlines first. China halts work on two dam projects in Pakistan. It comes just days after a suicide bomber killed five Chinese engineers in the country. Chinese firms demand better protection from authorities in Pakistan. Beijing is Islamabad's closest regional ally. Ukraine says its power supply is under severe threat amid relentless attacks by Russia. Kiev imposes blackouts, asking citizens to use electricity sparingly. In recent weeks, Moscow has targeted Ukraine's energy infrastructure. President Zelensky calls it Russia's energy terrorism. Ukrainian Foreign Minister meets India's External Affairs Minister in Delhi. Both leaders discuss the Russia-Ukraine war. Kiev seeks New Delhi's help in ending the conflict. Dmitry Kuleba's visit comes a week after Prime Minister Modi spoke to both President Zelensky and President Putin. Indonesia's president-elect Prabowo Subianto will visit China on Sunday. This will be his first overseas visit after winning the election. Beijing is among Jakarta's top foreign investors. Prabowo will take office later this year. And Polish president vetoes move to relax access to emergency contraception. The ruling coalition had put forward the proposal. In 2017, the previous right-wing government had made prescription mandatory for emergency contraception. Have you heard of FOMO, the fear of missing out? It's the favorite trick of the investment industry. When they want you to invest your money, they use FOMO. They say things like, now is the time. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. If you do not invest now, you will regret it later. And most people fall for it. They part with their money. I'm sure you've, had, uh, you've heard such a pitch before. Tonight, we'll talk about the man who mastered it, Sam Bankman-Fried. He turned FOMO into a fine art and himself into one of the world's youngest billionaires, nicknamed the Crypto King, with his face plastered on magazines and billboards. He hobnobbed with famous actors, celebrities and sports stars. He became a billionaire before he turned 30. He set up a $32 billion empire and then he lost it all. In 2022, it came crashing down. Turned out Bankman Freed had embezzled money. He'd stolen $8 billion from his customers. When the scam came to light, his empire went bust. He'd built something called FTX. It was a crypto exchange, sort of like a marketplace, where you could use real money like dollars or euros to buy digital money like Bitcoin or Ether. Basically, you could buy cryptocurrency here. At its peak, FTX was the world's largest crypto exchange. Then Bankman Freed started pulling investor money from FTX. He took the money out and he used it to make risky bets on which he suffered big losses. In the end, FTX collapsed like a house of cards. The cryptocurrency industry might be new. The players like Sam Bankman Freed might be new. But this kind of fraud, this kind of corruption is as old as time and we have no patience for it. Sam Bankman-Fried was found guilty of conspiracy and fraud and sentenced to 25 years in jail. Currently, he's 32 years of age. By the time he's out, he'll be 57 and he will lose his assets too. 
The court has asked him to give up $11 billion worth of assets. This money will be used to repay the victims of his fraud. Now, Bankman Freed says he did not want to cause harm and he plans to appeal the verdict. But the evidence is tagged against him and his story has become a cautionary tale for cryptocurrency investors everywhere in the world. Which brings us to the larger picture. How will this case impact the crypto market? The space is still quite challenging to navigate because cryptocurrency breaks all traditional rules and formats of money. Crypto is not tangible. You cannot see or touch it. And investing it is even more complicated. The market is very speculative. I'll give you one example. Compare Bitcoin with your traditional assets, like gold. Say you have a gold bar. You can assign value to this bar based on its weight or purity levels. Then you have stocks. And you could argue that stock markets also operate on speculation, and you'd be right, but stock markets are also tightly regulated. Plus, you can assign the price of a share based on the company's performance, based on its profit and loss statements, and the assets on its books. This is the traditional way. But Bitcoin has no weight or purity levels and no underlying assets or company statements, nothing tangible. So how do you determine its price? Through demand. The higher the demand, the higher the price. That's how cryptocurrencies are valued, based on their demand. And this makes them very volatile. One tweet by Elon Musk can swing the cryptocurrency market more than the budget speech of a major economy. And we've seen such swings over and over again. In recent weeks, Bitcoin has witnessed a massive rally. Earlier this month, the price of one Bitcoin crossed $72,000. At the beginning of this year, one Bitcoin was worth $42,000. So the price has jumped by over 70%. In less than three months, a 70% jump. Earlier today, Bitcoin was hovering around $70,000, so the price still remains quite high, meaning Sam Bankman Fried's conviction has not dampened spirits. And that's true for the Indian market too. Cryptocurrency is not legal tender in India, but you can invest in it. And Indians are doing it in large numbers. There's been a surge in crypto investments in India. India's top crypto exchanges have seen a big jump in trading. We're talking about the likes of Vazirx. CoinDCX and ZebPay. These are India's top three exchanges. Between February and March, trading at these exchanges has shot up by over 200%. And what is the value of these trades? Well over $500 million. In fact, India now has the world's second largest crypto market. Crypto transactions in India are worth well over $260 billion. And this is despite the fact that India charges one of the highest tax rates on crypto transactions. Profits face a 30% tax rate. So if you make a profit of, say, 1,000 rupees from a, from a crypto transaction, you'll owe the government 300 rupees in taxes. But even this high tax rate has not deterred investors, and it has left India's regulators worried. Earlier this year, Shakti Kanta Das spoke about it. He's the chief of India's Reserve Bank. And he said cryptocurrencies are, and I'm quoting, instruments with no underlying value. And they pose a risk to emerging market economies like India. In fact, let me quote him further. While others might see a renewed cryptocurrency party, we see significant risks. That's what the chief of India's central bank has said. He is advising caution. Clearly, he's worried about a bubble in this market. So India's investors should be careful. Take lessons from the fall of Sam Bankman-Fried and do not let FOMO dictate your investment choices. The humanitarian Lage in Gaza is the hell. Rights of the Palestinians and the fact that they have been denied their home. Don't bet on this pressure, it's not going to work. And I hope they got the message. 
Things are getting worse in Gaza, if that was even possible. Almost half of the population is facing food insecurity. That's almost 1.1 million people. And the next stage could be famine. Just let that sink in. A famine in the 21st century. A United Nations court says it is already here. Around 30 Gazans have died of malnutrition. 27 of them were children. So the UN court has issued a binding order. It wants Israel to offer immediate help to unlock food aid to Gaza. But will Benjamin Netanyahu agree to it? Well, don't count on it. This week, the United Nations Security Council finally agreed on a ceasefire. They asked Israel to stop the war in Gaza. And what did Israel do? They ignored it. Take a look at these pictures released by Israel. They show airstrikes inside Gaza, and this happened after the UNSC resolution. So not only is Israel ignoring it, it is openly flaunting the violations. Which brings us to the global sentiment. It's now firmly anti-Israel. Let me show you what happened in London. Protesters accused the UK government of selling weapons to Israel, so they barged into the Trade Department building. Take a look at this. Same in the United States. President Joe Biden was holding a fundraiser in New York. He was accompanied by two former presidents, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. But outside, a major protest was underway. Biden, Obama and Clinton were accused of supporting a genocide. No justice, no peace. No Zionism, our no justice, no peace. I came out here today to protest uh, President Biden, who all of us here consider a war criminal. I do not welcome Joe Biden or the other genocidal presidents he has here tonight with him. Tough words there, but what are Western leaders doing to address this? Their new strategy is airdrops. Fly military planes over Gaza, drop food and medicine packets and then fly away. They don't care about what happens afterwards. This week, there was one such drop. Aid packets landed in the sea off northwest Gaza. Dozens of people flung themselves into the ocean and 12 of them drowned to death. This is the reality of aid missions in Gaza. Sometimes you drown to death, sometimes you get shot to death. A new video shows exactly this. Two Gazan men were walking on the beach. Both of them were waving a white flag. It's supposed to signal surrender, a white flag. But out of nowhere, the Israeli army shot and killed them. Later, they were buried with a bulldozer. Such pictures are hard to ignore. Just like these from a hospital in northern Gaza, it, was, it is treating newborn babies. Most of them suffer from malnutrition. In fact, I have some numbers for you. In January, malnutrition among children below two was 15%. By March, it had doubled. Today, one in three Gazan children are malnourished. Considering my experience and my work here, if things persist this way, the situation will deteriorate and get worse. There is no good consequences, especially in northern Gaza. In northern Gaza, I see similar cases every day. It's a daily struggle. You've seen the pictures. So have leaders and politicians across the world. Many of them stood by Israel after October 7. They condemned Hamas's attack. attack. They co condemned Hamas's terrorism. They also supported Israel's response. But now all that's changing. A prime example of that is India. New Delhi was very vocal in criticizing the Hamas attack. Prime Minister Modi called it terrorism. But as the war dragged on, India tweaked its position. Listen to Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar's remarks this week. On the one hand, what happened on October 7th was terrorism. On the other hand, nobody would, uh, you know, countenance the deaths of innocent civilians. Countries may be, uh, may be uh, justified, at least in their own minds, in responding. But you cannot have a response which does not, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, every response must take into account something called international humanitarian law. And the fact is 
that whatever the rights and wrongs of the issue, there is the underlying issue of the rights of the Palestinians and the fact that they have been denied their homeland. So Israel's actions have left them isolated. Their few Arab allies are livid, like Jordan, for example. Thousands of protesters have gathered in front of the Israeli embassy. They have been protesting for five days. Now, Jordan and Israel signed a peace deal in 1994. It's already a very unpopular deal in Jordan, and this war is making it worse. Many protesters want their government to cancel it, to deny recognition to Israel. So clearly, the pressure is building on Netanyahu, both from the outside and inside. His so-called unity cabinet is anything but united. One of his top ministers has already quit. Yet, Netanyahu is defiant. Therefore, my decision not to send the delegation to Washington in the wake of that resolution was a message to Hamas. It was a message, first and foremost, to Hamas. Don't bet on this pressure. It's not going to work. Israel is already looking at the next target, the border town of Rafah. It's home to almost one and a half million Gazans, most of them displaced from elsewhere. The Israeli army has already started bombing the city. The next step could be a ground invasion. And if that happens, it could be a bloodbath. So the question is, who can stop Netanyahu? The U.S. has tried. The United Nations Security Council has tried. And the U.N. courts have tried, but all of them have failed. Maybe the last bet could be the people of Israel. Perhaps pressure at home can force Netanyahu to stop. Let's turn to India now. The election battle is heating up fast and the new frontier is taxes. Now do not get mistaken. Political parties are not squabbling about our taxes. They're squabbling about theirs. That's right. India's main opposition party, the Congress Party, has been pulled up by the tax authorities. They've received a notice from the Income Tax Department. And what does it say? That the books are not in order. There are discrepancies in the Congress's tax returns. We're talking about a five-year period from 2017-18 to 2020-21. And how much money is at stake? More than 1,800 crore rupees, which is around $215 million. That's penalty plus recovery, plus interest. Now, the Congress party has rejected this notice. They're calling it tax terrorism by the ruling BJP. This is BJP ki bhasha mein hi, aaj hamare jenge. So what next? The Congress is already low on funds. They're planning to approach the Supreme Court next week, maybe get a stay order on this notice. But what exactly is this case all about? Where do political parties get money from and how much tax do they pay? Let's look at these three questions. The Congress is facing multiple tax investigations. One of them dates back to 1994. It accuses the party of not keeping proper records. Apparently, this was flagged in 1997, but the Congress party challenged this accusation in court. Almost 30 years later, it has emerged again. The IT department wants to recover 53 crore rupees, which is six and a half million US dollars. Another case dates back to 2019. It was election year in India, 2019. All parties had to submit their tax returns by December 31st, but the Congress party missed the deadline. Now let's take a short detour here. I mentioned that parties have to submit tax returns. But do they also have to pay taxes? The answer is no. Political parties are 100% exempt from taxes. And not just on donations, even on income from other sources, say a building on rent or interest payment on a deposit, all of it is tax exempt in India. Now we come to the Congress party in 2019. If the income is tax exempt, what is the problem? Why is the IT department after the Congress party? Because of the deadline. If you miss the final date, you lose the exemption. You enter in, you, your entire income becomes taxable. That is the rule. Now, in the Congress's case, that was around 199 crore rupees. So the ID department wanted the party to pay up. The Congress tried getting help from the Delhi High Court, but the judges dismissed the plea. 
So this month, the taxmen made their move. They recovered money from the Congress's bank account. How much money? Around 135 crore rupees. That's recovery plus interest. We're talking about almost $16 million. The third tax case is arguably much bigger. It covers seven years from 2014 to 2021. The IT department is alleging, quote unquote, unaccounted transactions. Again, worth how much? More than 500 crore rupees. And finally, you have the latest notice of 1,800 crore rupees. So put together, the Congress is in deep trouble and the timing is pretty bad. India's general elections are slated for next month. The first phase begins in around 20 days from now. So the Congress needs the money now to publish advertisements, to ferry its top campaigners, to hold rallies and roadshows, to pay fuel and other expenses. But if the bank accounts are frozen, how will the Congress pay up? That's the big worry for their leaders. They say this is an attempt to financially cripple the party, to derail their campaign. But the impact could go beyond this election. And I'll tell you why. Most of these cases predate India's electoral bonds. It was a time when donations were made directly. If the amount was more than 20,000 rupees, parties had to record it. They had to file it with the income tax department. Anything more than 20,000 rupees. But the poll bonds appended the system. Such direct donations virtually disappeared overnight. Instead, everyone bought bonds. Now, with the bonds scrapped, these donations will return. And there's a lot at stake here. This case could set a precedent going forward. We'll be tracking the Congress's next moves closely. If the Supreme Court of India gets involved next week, things could get interesting. For our next story, let's go back in time. It's the late 1990s. The Taliban is in power in Afghanistan. Girls are barred from school. Women are absent from public life. They cannot step out of their homes. If they have to, a man must accompany them. Also, they must be covered from head to toe. You may remember this blue burqa. It became the global symbol of the Taliban rule, a symbol of their oppressive regime. Now let's fast forward to 2024, to today. The Taliban is in power in Afghanistan. Girls are barred from school. Two and a half million girls and young women are out of school. Women are absent from public life. They are not allowed to work. They are not allowed to travel. They wear a burqa that covers them from head to toe. If they don't, there are consequences. As we speak, at least 800 women are being held in Taliban prisons. Others are dying by suicide. Women make up for 80%, 80% of recorded suicide attempts in Afghanistan. They account for almost 75% of the deaths. Essentially, it's all the same. Taliban 1.0, Taliban 2.0, it doesn't really matter. Women were oppressed then and women are oppressed now. In fact, they're worse off. Because the Taliban has made a new announcement. It comes from the supreme leader, this man, Hebatullah Akhunzada. He said the Taliban are reintroducing old methods. Public flogging and stoning to death. They're bringing these back. Flogging and stoning to death. And who will be the victims? Who will face this punishment? The women of Afghanistan, they will be flogged and stoned to death if they commit adultery. And this is only for women. It's shocking, but not surprising, because the Taliban have done it before. Last year alone, they ordered 417 public floggings and executions. So this announcement hardly makes a difference, but it shows you one thing, that the Taliban have not changed. They ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001, and they came to power again in 2021. They took over Kabul, they formed a government, and they marketed themselves as a new Taliban. The Taliban 2.0. It was said to be different. More moderate, whatever that means. What is a moderate terrorist? But the world lapped it up. Look at their first press conference, for example. This is what their spokesperson said. And I'm quoting the Taliban spokesperson. Our sisters, our men have the same rights. They are going to be working with us, shoulder to shoulder, with us. They promised to not repeat the cruelties of the 90s. They said women and men should have equal rights. Yet nearly three years later, here we are. Forget equal rights. Women do not have any rights in Afghanistan. In the last two years, the Taliban have issued 80 edicts. 54 of these directly targeted women and girls. So what they sold to the world was a lie. 
a marketing gimmick to rebrand themselves. They have the same old draconian policies. They practice the same gender apartheid. Which brings us to the country, Afghanistan. It's a country on the verge of collapse. 97% of its people live in poverty. 97%. 60% need humanitarian assistance. 20 million people face hunger. People are selling their organs. Parents are selling their children, all to afford a meal in Afghanistan. But that is not the Taliban's priority. Their focus is on the 14 million women and girls how to deprive them of rights, and how to erode all the gains they made in the last two decades. A United Nations report says excluding women is costing the Afghan economy almost $1 billion. That's 5% of their GDP. Yet the Taliban continues to remove them from public life, and the world could not care less. They pretend it's not happening. They failed Afghan women in the 90s, and they failed them again today. Our next story is from South Africa. It goes to polls this summer. It was supposed to be a clash between the current president and his predecessor, Cyril Ramaphosa versus Jacob Zuma. But now there's a major twist in the tale. Zuma has been disqualified. South Africa's Electoral Commission has passed an order. They've barred Jacob Zuma from contesting. He is a former president. He led the country from 2009 to 2018. He's still massively popular and a thorn in the ruling party's side. So will he still be able to run for president? What will his exit mean for the South African election? And why has he been barred in the first place? Our next report has the answers. South Africa's ruling party has been given a shot in the arm. A dangerous opponent is out of the way. Friend turned foe, Jacob Zuma. In the case of former president Zuma, yes, we did receive an objection. Um, which has been upheld. Zuma has been barred from the upcoming election thanks to a technicality. And this has lifted the hopes of South Africa's ruling party, the African National Congress, who really needed this ahead of the election on the 29th of May. You see, South Africa has been ruled by one political party continuously for three decades, the ANC. It's the party of Nelson Mandela, the party at the forefront of the fight against institutionalized racism, apartheid. Because of Mandela and his legacy, the ANC has kept winning elections. Despite numerous scams, declining economic growth and poor governance. But South Africans are slowly losing faith. Every year, the ANC bleeds votes. And this year, it was set to face a major blow. Opinion polls say that the ANC will get less than 50% of the vote, meaning they'll need to form a coalition if they want to remain in power. This is unprecedented in post-apartheid South Africa. It's a wake-up call for the ANC. So, what has the party decided to do? Apparently, go after the competition. Especially one man, a man they know well, former president and ANC leader Jacob Zuma. Zuma was modern South Africa's fourth president. He ruled from 2009 to 2018. And in many ways, he's emblematic of the Malays in the ANC. Zuma is an accused in a defense procurement scam from the 1990s when he was vice president. Zuma was slammed for his close ties to the Indian origin Gupta family, who apparently went about capturing the state under his watch, allegedly with his blessing. At one point, Zuma was even called Zupta to highlight his ties with the Gupta family. So, Zuma has seen his fair share of controversy, but he is yet to be convicted. Zuma didn't cooperate while being investigated for corruption and defied court orders. So, he was sentenced to 15 months in prison. Zuma went to jail in July 2021. He was let out in two months on medical parole, but this doesn't change the fact that he received a 15-month sentence. That sentence disqualifies him from the upcoming election. In South Africa, anyone sentenced to more than 12 months imprisonment without the option of a fine cannot stand for election. So, Zuma has been disqualified. The ANC challenged Zuma's candidacy after he joined a rival party. Zuma's new party was expected to get about 12% of the vote. 12% that the ANC desperately needs to maintain its majority in parliament. 
so they've been trying their best to dismantle the competition. Both Zuma and his party have been in the crosshairs, and it seems the ANC has managed to land a strike. Will this be enough? Will Zuma's disqualification pave the way for the ANC's return? We'll find out in a few months. Now let's turn to Nigeria, where a tomato puree review has landed a woman in jail. I'm not making this up. A woman put up a Facebook post. She complained about a tomato mix. She said it was too sweet. And the Nigerian police decided to arrest her. She now faces multiple cases, up to seven years in jail and a fine of five billion naira. That's about three million US dollars. So three million dollars and seven years in jail, all for a bad review of tomato mix. How is this kind of puree persecution possible? Apparently, Nigeria Cyber Crime Prohibition Act brooks no quarter. Before we get to the legal details, let's look at how we got here. What happened? The alleged crime took place last September, on September 17th. That's when our reviewer put up her Facebook post. Her name is Chioma Okoli. She is 39 years old, a mother of three, and presently expecting her fourth child. She is an entrepreneur, a small-scale importer of children's clothes. She lives in Nigeria's financial hub, Lagos. On September 16th, a day before she put up the post, she went and bought the tomato mix. Her usual brands were out of stock, so she decided to try a different one. Before using the puree, she decided to taste it, and clearly she was not a fan. So she took to Facebook to air her grievances. She claimed the puree was too sweet, that there was too much sugar in it. And she asked her Facebook followers for their opinion. Now this set off a furious online debate, apparently with a puree maker's relative, or at least an ardent fan, someone calling themselves Blessing. Now, Blessing began the accursed chain of retribution. They told our reviewer not to bring her problems on social media and she should call customer service instead or just choose a different tomato mix brand. Sounds like every other social media stranger looking to pick a fight. So our reviewer shot back. She told Blessing that the sauce was pure sugar and that it was killing people. Now, up to this point, what do you think? Normal, heated debate on social media, right? Nothing insidious. Well, seven days later, our reviewer was arrested. Apparently, the Nigerian police think she was part of a criminal conspiracy. I'm serious. This is what she has been charged with. Plotting to instigate people against the tomato mix maker. Not just that, she was charged with intentionally making false claims online, an offence under Nigeria's Cyber Crime Prohibition Act. She faces seven years in prison in this conspiracy case and three years and a fine on the false information charge. But this is not even the worst part. Her arrest itself was horrifying. She says she was picked up from a church by officers in plain clothes. She was put in a holding cell without a place to sit and a leaky roof. She spent the night awake. The next day, she was flown out of the city, taken from Lagos to Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Have you ever heard of something like this? Someone being transferred to another city over a Facebook post about tomato puree. Nigeria's police force is quite proud of their approach, though. They say there is no sentiment in law. But seriously... Does the Nigerian police really have no other crimes to solve? Have they eradicated every other injustice in the country? That they had the time to transport a source reviewer? After being taken to Abuja, the reviewer was released the next day. She posted bail and promised to make a public apology to the Puree company. She says that promise was made under duress, so now she will not apologize. The police tried to arrest her again in January. Meanwhile, Nigerian courts have started hearing the case and there's no guarantee that the courts will throw it out. This has led to public anger in Nigeria. Protests have been on for months. But the, the, the authorities have not budged though. There are limits to the freedom of speech and expression and in Nigeria, a bad tomato puree review breaches that limit. Now, we believe that cyber crimes and hate speech should be prosecuted anywhere in the world. But this does not sound like one of those incidents. It's a farce, a vegetable vendetta, and a company being too sensitive and vindictive. No one should be fined or jailed for a bad review. 
Hopefully, Nigeria's courts recognize this for what it is, a case of sour grapes, or should I say, rotten tomatoes. Now let's talk about that interview. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi sat down with Bill Gates, Microsoft founder and now philanthropist. And this interaction is generating a lot of buzz today. Obviously, the timing has not escaped anyone. India is heading into an election. And through this interview, the Prime Minister has tried to highlight India's advances in the tech space. Prime Minister Modi himself is seen as tech savvy. He was one of the first Indian leaders to embrace social media. He's used holograms to address election rallies. And he frequently engages with global tech leaders. In that sense, this interaction was a meeting of the minds. Bill Gates is the founder of Microsoft, one of the biggest tech companies in the world, and his Gates Foundation has wide interests in India. They're involved in a lot of projects, which encourage the use of technology in the delivery of public goods. And Gates believes that India's homegrown solutions like Aadhaar and UPI have set global benchmarks. Through this conversation with Prime Minister Modi, he's trying to make a case for other nations to study India's progress. Here are some highlights. Well, the G20 is way more inclusive. And so it was fantastic to see that uh, India and hosting it really raised things like digital innovation uh, and how this South-South collaboration can be far more than just the dialogue with the North. It was true that when I was in the G20 in Indonesia, I was in the G20. All of the countries of the world's curiosity was to know how to bring this digital revolution. So this is my concern. That's why it's very good in my country. And we are probably the इंडस्ट्रियल लिवर्सन्स हो गए फर्स्ट सेकंड हम पीछे रह गए क्योंकि हम गुलाम थे ये चौथा जो इंडस्ट्रियल रिवोल्यूशन है जिसमें डिजिटल एलिमेंट सबसे बड़ा है और भारत इसमें बहुत कुछ प्राप्त कर लेगा ऐसा मेरा विश्वास है आई थिंक द की पॉइंट इज द डिजिटल इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर जस्ट गेट्स कीपिंग रिचर यू नो लॉर पीपल नो अबाउट द uh, identity system and the digital payment systems. And we're just at the beginning now of the third phase where these advances in artificial intelligence will come on top of that and make the value even better. You said that AI is a lot of power. And I always say that in our country, we call the mother of the mother. अब मैं कहता हूं हमारे यहां बच्चा पैदा होता है तो आई भी बोलता है ए आई भी बोलता है आई लव टू हियर योर व्यू ऑन हाउ इंडिया सीज ए आई अगर हम ए आई को एक मैजिक के टूल के रूप में उपयोग करेंगे तो शायद बहुत बड़ा अन्याय हो जाएगा या ए आई का उपयोग अपने आलसीपन को बचाने के लिए मैं करता हूं क्योंकि मुझे किसी को चिट्ठी लिखनी है मैं ड्राफ्ट नहीं करूंगा मैं चैट जीपीटी को कह दूंगा कि मेरी चिट्ठी ड्राफ्ट करके दे दो तो ये गलत रास्ता है मुझे तो चैट जीपीटी के साथ कंपटीशन करना चाहिए मैंने उसके साथ लड़ाई लड़नी चाहिए कि नहीं तुम ठीक नहीं कर रहे हो तुम ये शब्द की जगह ये क्यों नहीं लाए तो मैं ए से आगे जाने की कोशिश करूँ यू नो सीम्स आई के आईस अज ऑपरचुनिटी बट देर सम चैलेंजेस Think India will approach that. Deep fake. Bharat is a democratic country, and in such a large country, no one will add anything to deep fake. If you add anything to my voice, then people will believe it. It will be very bad. So it is necessary that deep fake AI will be generated. And this is a source. This is a ये आज शुरू के दिनों में आगे चल करके क्या होगा जरूरत नहीं पड़ेगी शायद लेकिन ये हमने कुछ डूज एंड डोंट्स उस पर सीरियसली सोचना पड़ेगा या आई बिन इंटरेस्टेड इन योर डिस्कशंस अबाउट ग्रीन जीडीपी अपडेट मी ऑन योर योर थिंकिंग मैं तो कहता हूं दुनिया को ग्रीन जीडीपी के कांसेप्ट को डेवलप करना चाहिए कि भाई तुम्हारे टोटल जीडीपी में ग्रीन जीडीपी कितनी है टोटल रोजगार में ग्रीन रोजगार कितने हैं हम एक नया आखिर टर्मिनोलॉजी बदलनी चाहिए दुनिया की 
तो मैं समझता हूँ कि समस्या का समाधान हो सकता है Uh, but I'm just curious when you do want to relax uh do you have a game or something that uh uh helps you to to take time off mere yahan relaxation autopilot hai aur wo mere zindagi ko mili hui ek spiritual prasadi hai mere gurujano se jo mujhe bahut badi urja deti hai काम ज़्यादा कर सकता हूँ करता हूँ वो मेरा कोई फिजिकल एनर्जी के कारण है ऐसा मुझे नहीं लगता है मेरे कमिटमेंट के कारण है These are some nutrition books. Finally we're making progress on nutrition. Yes. Uh, Thank you. तमिलनाडु में थोड़ी कोटी वहाँ पर ये मोती बनाते हैं और एक प्रकार से पल सिटी के रूप में जाना जाता है बहुत बड़ा काम वहाँ के फिशरमैन करते हैं मैं गया था मैंने सोचा आज आपको ये दिखाऊंगा भी और आपके लिए ले जाऊंगा थैंक्स सो मच भारत में वैसे तेराकोटा एक बहुत पुरानी परंपरा है लेकिन ये तमिलनाडु का आर्ट है ये बहुत पॉपुलर होता है मंदिरों में रहता है घरों में भी रहता है पूजा के लिए भी इसी प्रकार की विशेष चीज़ें बनाते हैं वहाँ ये हैं पशमीना स्क्राफ्ट है और ये हमारे यहाँ बहुत ही पॉपुलर है कश्मीर में ये केसर है ये भी कश्मीर का है सारा किसानों का ये पूरा वैल्यू एडिशन होता है और बहुत ग्लोबली एक्सपोर्ट होता है ये हमारे यहाँ वोकल फॉर लोकल मेरा एक मूवमेंट चल रहा है तो मैं चाहूँगा ये सब आपको मेरी यादें आपके साथ रहे <laughs> Yes, you're very generous. I look forward to that. It'll remind me about <laughs> our, our time together. Thank you. Thank you. Have you heard of Shao Hong Shu? It means the little red book. But the one we are talking about tonight has nothing to do with Mao Zedong. This one is a Chinese social media platform, almost like their Instagram. Xiao Hong Shu was launched in the year 2013. It began as a shopping guide. Users could review products, they could share their experiences, and others would learn from them. In 2014, the app tried to capitalize on it. It set up a cross-border shopping platform. Basically, it had global retailers. Chinese users could buy from them. A seamless shopping experience for all. Over time it grew in popularity by 2017 Xiao Hong Shu had over 50 million users so investors took notice in 2018 it received a funding of 300 million dollars mostly from Tencent and Alibaba the company was valued at 3 billion dollars and since then the app has evolved now it's almost like a lifestyle bible imagine a mix of Instagram Reddit and Pinterest that's what it is and the chinese users love it You see access to western apps is blocked in China so people there do not have Facebook or Instagram they have Xiao Hong Shu it's widely popular you can share photos you can live stream content you can talk about your shopping experience plus there's an in app shopping interface in 2021 Xiao Hong Shu was valued at 20 billion dollars last year it posted a profit of 500 million dollars it is available across the globe including in countries like India currently it has 300 million monthly users and they're not limited to china anymore americans seem to love this app it started with a new beauty trend it's called ting chuan it means listening to advice essentially you post a photo and others vein they tell you what they think of it you could say that happens on all social media platforms you post something and people comment and they have a lot to say good bad ugly but the advice on Sh- xiao hong shu is a bit different in the comments there are no flowery compliments no you look great or what a wonderful outfit none of it the comments are unsettlingly direct they are blunt they offer you advice users tell you what you should change and what would look good on you what could work for you in the future of course it's not everyone's cup of tea but america's gen z love it Hashtag Ting Chuan has over 500 million views. American teens are getting on the app. They're using translation software to post, and they're translating back the feedback. 
And unlike most Chinese apps that make it difficult for overseas users to join, all that this app needs is a phone number. So American teens are on it. So are American celebrities. Kim Kardashian is on this app. American model Carly Kloss posts on it. It's becoming popular. And that may not be good news for the U.S. that is still trying to figure out how to uninstall TikTok. It's become a big political and legal issue in America. TikTok is a Chinese company. It's owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance. And it is one of America's most popular apps. 170 million Americans are on it. They're on TikTok, 170 million Americans. They're glued to this app for 56 minutes every day. That's the average. Washington is concerned about Chinese influence, about data security, and about spying. This month, the US Congress passed a bill. They gave TikTok an ultimatum. Either divest the company or face a ban. So the US is already struggling with one popular Chinese app. Can it afford another one to captivate its youth? Plus, Xiao Hong Shu is not all games and no surveillance. There are concerns about this app too. In 2022, the Taiwan government banned it from official devices. They said it was due to national security concerns. So Washington must be on guard. A growing user base comes with the same risks. They must monitor it before it's too late. Now let's look at Argentina and its president, Javier Millet. He's not your typical president. He assumed office last year after an unusual presidential campaign, a campaign laden with expletives and stunts involving a chainsaw. Basically, Millet was a foul-mouthed, no-nonsense candidate who liked to put on a show. This direct approach may have won him the presidency, but it has not won him too many friends, especially among his peers in Latin America. Millet has alienated and now angered his fellow Latin presidents. Clips from a candid interview are going viral, where Millet insults the presidents of Colombia and Mexico. Colombia is furious. It has expelled Argentine diplomats. The Mexican president is not amused either. He has given a stinging rebuke. But will this be enough to make Millet behave? Here's our report. The butchery in Venezuela is unheard of. Same with the jail that is Cuba. There are other cases that are on their way to becoming like Venezuela, such as Colombia with Colombian President Gustavo Petro. We cannot expect much from someone who was a murderer, terrorist and a communist. It is flattering that an ignorant like López Obrador speaks ill of me. It exalts me. One interview, multiple broadsides. That sums up Argentine President Javier Millet's approach. He's not concerned with politeness or diplomacy. He has taken his favorite tool, the chainsaw, to foreign relations. Now, to understand Millet's unique approach, we need to understand the man. Millet has been a lot of things, an economics professor, author, singer in a Rolling Stones cover band and a radio show host. But he rose to fame because of another profession. Being a participant in television debates. You know, one of those yelling heads on so-called news debates. Millet was aggressive, abusive and adored by the public. They thought he was honest, which is what led to his popularity. Eventually, Millet entered politics, and his anger against the former government fueled his rise. Argentina's economy has been in dire straits for years. Annual inflation was over 211% in 2023. The people were clamoring for change, which is why they chose Millet last year. He promised to take a chainsaw to Argentina's problems and destroy the existing political system. Aggressive and unorthodox, that has always been his style. It's why Argentina elected him. But this brash approach has some setbacks too. Domestically, his agenda has led to quite some pain. Like for instance, drastically reducing government jobs. He calls it shock therapy, for the greater good. But thousands are furious, and they've been protesting. That's the domestic part. However, Mille isn't content with that. He has chosen to anger external forces as well, like Colombia and Mexico, and the rest of Latin America. One, Mille has always been a firebrand, and two, Mille and Argentina are the outliers in the region. For the past few years, Latin America has seen a so-called pink tide, 
a turn towards leftist politics. Mile hates this. He blames left-wing politics for Argentina's problems. So he views all other Latin American nations as the enemy. Combine this with his colorful TV debate past and you see why he's insulting all his neighbors. This time he may have gone too far. Colombia is furious. Bogota says this was the last straw. President Gustavo Petro has expelled all Argentine diplomats from the country. The Mexican president doesn't seem as angry. He hasn't expelled any diplomats yet, but he has chosen to retort on social media and lend his support to Colombia. So Mile may actually be good for regional relations. He seems to be bringing Latin America together in their mutual dislike for him. Move over Taylor Swift and Travis, Travis Kelsey, because internet now has a new favorite couple, a rather unlikely one, President Emmanuel Macron of France and President Lula da Silva of Brazil. Don't believe us? See for yourself. Taylor and Travis could never. And as you would expect, the internet is loving it. Some users are asking the obvious question, was this a diplomatic trip or a pre-wedding photo shoot? Well, President Macron has the answer. It looks like he's seen all the chatter on social media, so he decided to jump in. Macron says it was a wedding. He says France loves Brazil and Brazil loves France. Now we could focus on the news here like why Macron was in Brazil, what deals did he sign, and what is at stake here, but where's the fun in that? You have two world leaders skipping through the jungles of the Amazon, and they give you pictures like this, on a boat, holding hands, staring at the forest canopy, holding hands, and for some reason running away together, again holding hands. It's criminal not to see these pictures and make memes, or to see these pictures and not make memes, so that's what the internet did. Here's that picture of Macron and Lula skipping away. Except the background is different. The Amazon is gone, the forest. Instead, it's the poster of Hollywood musical La La Land. Macron himself retweeted it. Another user added some more love to the pictures. They put heart-shaped balloons in the background. It looks like Macron and Lula are releasing them together. Then you had more movie inspiration, Macron and Lula on one side, Bella and Edward from Twilight on the other. I must say the resemblance is great. Such bromances have become a part of modern day diplomacy. Like any bromance, there are many levels. Some get up close and personal, like Macron and Lula here. Others like their own space, like Putin and Xi Jinping. So let's look at some of the more famous bromances in diplomacy. Indian Prime Minister Modi is also quite good at it. You may remember his day out at the beach with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. That was peak bromance. Modi and Macron also have great chemistry. They've met multiple times in the last few years, but one meeting stands out. The one in July last year, Modi was guest of honor for France's National Day. He was seen enjoying the fireworks show with Macron. Again, peak bromance.
Another popular bro was Barack Obama, the former American president. He had a transatlantic bromance with his British counterpart, former Prime Minister David Cameron. They had a lot of outings together. Flipping burgers, playing table tennis, watching basketball and eating hot dogs. People thought, wow, they must love each other. But later accounts tell a different story. A Cameron aide said the Prime Minister couldn't stand Obama. He thought he was a narcissist. Even some strongman politicians have dabbled in bromance, like Xi Jinping and Putin. She once called Putin his best, most intimate friend. They've also exchanged gifts. Once both men were together for Xi Jinping's birthday, Putin gifted the Chinese president a box of ice cream. Like I said, a different type of romance. Neither Putin nor she are huggers. They show warmth from a distance. The question is, what should we make of these bromances? They're important, but not too important. Just look at Biden and Netanyahu. Forget bromance, they hate each other. But when it counted, Biden stood by Israel. Because bilateral relations go beyond personal equations. There are bigger factors at play. Having said that, these equations do help sometimes, like during tough negotiations. If you're comfortable with your counterpart, things become easier. But let's put politics aside for a bit. Even otherwise, such bromances are important. They send a nice message on bonding. It's something we do not see among politicians very often. There's a perception that you have to exude strength, have the firm handshake, and detach yourself emotionally. But these leaders have shown that is not necessary. You can hold hands, you can watch fireworks together, flip burgers, or play some sports. Who cares if it looks like a pre-wedding shoot? And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Iceland, a volcano was caught erupting against the backdrop of the northern lights. In Brazil, a raging fire engulfs a high-rise building that was under construction. And in the Czech Republic, a snow border pulls off the world's first triple flip-off of a, a rail. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1973, the last American troops left Vietnam. The U.S. had sent active combat units in 1965. At its peak, they had at least 550,000 soldiers in Vietnam, but opposition to the war bitterly divided Americans. Washington's direct eight-year intervention came to an end after the Paris Peace Accords. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. From impeachment to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up.